so, uh, so that's out on three analysis um, This is where you <coughs> we also have unfortunately documentation living mm -hmm. other places. We are working to consolidate our documentation. For example, this confluence page is where you go for the installation instructions for the simulation software. Um, and the plug I want to give for why you should be using the LSST simulation software specifically is because this is software that is being developed in parallel with the data management software. For example, the LSST simulation software has models for the LSST camera, which means that we have tools that can convert an RA depth position on this guy to an actual pixel position on an actual chip on the LSST camera. So if you're worried, for example, somebody at one point mentioned about the fact that we only actually fill 90% of our footprint because of the gaps between chips. We can account for that. Specifically, we can tell you, if you tell us where the telescope is pointing at any, any given time, we can tell you where the gaps between the chips should be. Um, the code we built is open source. It's all on GitHub, which means if you think you can make it better, you can fork it, you can make your changes, you can make a pull request back to our GitHub repositories, and if you made it better, we'll accept it. Um, uh, and, and finally, as I said, it's being developed in close contact with the engineering teams. We have libraries that contain the most up-to-date uh, throughput information on what the filters are going to be, um, and, and the, yeah, throughput, including you know, throughput through the lenses and the reflectance of the mirrors and all, the, all those physical effects as it has been told to us by the people actually building the camera. So if you want a simulation that is actually true to the LSST, the physical LSST thing that is being built in Chile, uh, this is the place to go. The LSST simulation software exists in what I like to think of as two major groups, uh, organized around answering two massive questions. Uh, there's the question of how are we going to schedule this thing? What is the observing cadence for what is the best observing cadence for LSST in order for us to deliver on all the science goals that we have promised you, the astronaut? Uh, and for that, to answer that question, we've developed two tools, which I will talk about later, or next. Uh, Opsim, the Operations Simulator, and MAC, the Metrics Analysis Framework. We've also developed tools to answer the question, how well do uh, our data analysis tools work? How, well, how good are we at characterizing variable sources, uh, photometrically classifying supernovae, measuring the shapes of galaxies, that sort of thing. And for that, we have developed tools the tools CATSIM, the Catalog Simulator, and IMSIM, the Image Simulator. Uh, Say the Image Simulator is a bit of a misnomer. We have two tools right now to simulate images, uh, BOSIM and GALSIM, both of which I will talk about at the end of this uh, talk. So let's start by talking about that first group of tools, the tools to answer how are we going to schedule the LSST. So OPSIM. The OPSIM, the Operations Simulator, is a high fidelity simulator of the physical telescope. That means that it has models for everything down to how fast the motors on LSST can slew to what the settle time is for the telescope after you have slew. And um, what, uh, so we have, we've combined that with, um, a, with uh, fiducial scheduling algorithms, which means that we can use OPSIN. The purpose of OPSIN is to generate simulated circuits. So we take OPSIM and its model of the physical telescope and uh, the scheduling algorithm, and a test scheduling algorithm. We combine them and you run it for, I guess now, which one, you run it for about three days. And what it does is it simulates the entire survey. It, it, it generates a database of observations saying, if you had used this scheduling algorithm on LSST, what, where would you have been pointing when for the entire 10-year history of the survey? Um, the, the code is designed to be as modular as possible. As I said, we're using test scheduling algorithms right now to generate these, these simulated surveys. Our hope is that those scheduling algorithms can just be removed from OPSIN and plugged into the actual telescope uh, when the time comes. Uh, and we're also working on um, making a modular, uh, a, what we call it, simulated observatory control system, which is going to be a simulation of the actual software that will control the telescope when we go on sky. And so there's a team in Tucson working with Austin right now and generating these simulated, uh, these simulated, simulated surveys uh, and releasing them to the scientific community so that you can tell us how well we did. Uh, I'll tell you what that means in a moment. This is a visualization of an output of Austin, uh, courtesy of Lynn Jones, another one of the uh, simulators at the University of Washington. And 
what she did was she just she took that database, remember I said OPSIM simulates the behavior of the LSST over 10 years and produces a database of observations, a data point base of, you know, where was the telescope pointing? What filter was it using? What were the seeing conditions like? What was what was the five sigma limiting magnitude? All of those things uh, uh, for the for use by the scientific community. And what Lynn did is she just took one of those databases and turned it into a movie. And so what we see here is this is a you know, this representation of the sky over an LSST, and you can see right here, this is where the telescope is going around observing. Uh, every time color changes, that represents a change in filter, as indicated here. Uh, and then you can see uh, on this panel here how the LSST is, over the course of the entire survey, gradually filling out, uh, filling out its area of observation. Uh, mostly this, is, this isn't really here for use outside of public outreach. We don't expect any real science to come out of a YouTube movie, but it's kind of Kind of fun to watch, uh, and it kind of gives you a sense of what our the scheduling algorithms we are working with now are doing. So, sorry, can I just ask a quick question? Though? Yeah. So, actually, I think that would be kind of useful for some debugging of the simulation. Certainly, uh, one of the issues we've had it would would have helped to really see that. Uh, so, is it available? Maybe I missed it. Um, is it uh, so? Okay. Uh, so the, the, the code to generate. Okay. So the code to generate this movie is actually all available. If you install the simulation stack in the math package, there are scripts. Something, something called like sinsmovie.py or something. And so you can, you can. Yes. If, if, if you want to, if you want to interact with it in this way, you definitely can. You can take one of those databases, take those scripts, and run them together and get something like this out. So no, that is definitely available. So, OPSIM generates your database of simulated, uh, simulated uh, your simulated observing things. Uh, as, let me say that again. OPSIM generates your simulated observing things as a database. The other set of tools we generated to help evaluate those simulated cases are the MATH, the Petrix Analysis Framework. And what MATH is, is a series of Python libraries, really a framework designed to ingest that database of simulated pointings and analyze it according to some user-defined metric. The idea of math is that we are providing a tool to the community and then the community is using that tool to answer questions that are, that, that are relevant to them. Um, math can analyze OPSIM runs in many different ways. There are tools to do things like just take an, op take an OPSIM run and produce heel-pixel maps <coughs> of the co-added five sigma limiting magnitude depth on the sky after 10 years. So See, just make sure that we're going as deep as we think we are in all of the filters after 10 years. There are, met, there are ways to write metrics where you can evaluate how frequently a given piece of sky is revisited over the course of the survey. So if you're worrying about variable stars or getting light curves of supernova, you can say, okay, you know, how many observations of this particular, of any given patch of sky do I really get in a, say, a three-loop period? Okay, if, you want to, if you want to worry about how, how well we were generating uh, or we're going to get supernova light curves. Um, math is, a, is an open-ended tool in which we want the community to give back to us ways in which to evaluate the usefulness of OPSIM. Because I think you have to remember about OPSIM is, as I said, OPSIM is the simulator part, the, the scheduler part of OPSIM is ultimately going to be the scheduler for the survey. And so we need to know from you, the scientists, you know, if we run this particular scheduler on, uh, on our telescope, will you be happy with the output? Uh, and if the answer is no, you need to tell us that so that we can fix the scheduler. Um, obviously, if you say no and someone else says yes, well, somebody who pays pay for it and gets to figure out who, who, who makes that fight. But the idea is we want as many ways as possible to evaluate the effectiveness of different scheduling algorithms so we can find the right scheduler. Um, and it is, it is remarkably easy to use. Uh, this, this script is just something that I wrote up in like 15 minutes. And it is a, it is a metric, uh, a, a math metric, in which I take an OPSIM database and, you can't see my person, but I have a laser. In which I just take an, an, OPSIM, an OPSIM database and analyze it for, okay, on each patch of the sky, give me the mean revisit time. Take all for every given patch of the sky. Take the number of observations, or all the observations made on that patch, and tell me what the mean time between the observations, between consecutive observations, was. I don't think that's actually useful. Maybe it is. I'm not a very old star person, but I just want to illustrate that with just you know 50 or 60 lines of code, I can get out plots that look like this, where we have a map of the sky, and then you have what the mean revisit time is. Uh, I limited it to the first two years of the survey because I wanted to run it. Um, and you can just see, okay, 
well. We're, you know, we have, we're, we're these, these patches of the sky got revisited very quickly. Um, I believe what you'll find is that they were not revisited as often as these patches, but all of their observations were front-loaded. Um, we got the deep drilling fields here where many, many, many observations are piled on top of each other, so the mean mean visit time is very low. And then you have the bulk of the survey where the mean mean visit time is, you know, on the order of three or four days. And maybe that's good for my science, maybe that's not. I'm not sure what science I had in mind when I wrote this metric. But the idea is we want you to write then write these Python functions to evaluate these surveys and tell us whether or not we have generated simulated surveys that are good for your science or bad for your science. And so the general workflow of that is going to be, right now at least, we have the same 2 song that is generating ops and runs, producing these simulated LSST observing cadences. We feed them to the community. Uh, hopefully, the community uh, uses map to analyze those research surveys and those proposed surveys and tell us whether or not we did a good job at delivering on our science goals, and then tell us that. And then based on the feedback we get, based on the outputs of all the different metrics that we run and all the different ways of evaluating these ops and surveys, these ops and, ops and simulations, we will decide whether we need to tweak ops and whether we need to change our scheduler algorithm and do something better, do something different. Uh, and then more awesome ones we generated, and it'll get, it'll get analyzed by math, and then the feedback will continue until we converge on the scheduler that will be used on an LSST. Right now, this is really the only way that can work. Uh, Opsin is kind of in a state where it, the Tucson team really should be running it in Tucson. We are working on versions of Opsin that will be that you'll be able to clone from GitHub and run it yourself on your own machine should you feel so inclined. If you are ambitious enough to say they can't write a scheduler, but I can write a scheduler, you will eventually have that high fidelity simulation of the telescope with all of the mechanical limitations uh, that will allow you to just plug your scheduler in and you know and design your own highly specialized supernova LSST or whatever it is that you would like to see the survey do. Uh, but that's that's still coming. Um, so the, uh, the the nitty gritty details of all that um, the awesome runs that are generated by the Tucson team are released at this. Uh, URL uh, looks something like that. You go to that URL, you get something like this, and what you'll see is you have grouped by date of release the benchmark surveys. These are uh, the, the databases generated by Opsin that are blessed or about to be, we hope, blessed by the project science team. Um, the Opsin team is constantly running simulations, and every six months or so, the project science team is evaluating them, saying, okay, yes, this is the schedule that we would use if we had to put LSST on Sky tomorrow, or maybe this is that schedule. So you will always have access to these benchmark um, best state-of-the-art LSST, or, uh, LSST sim uh, simulated cadences at this website. If you look at those cadences and decide that we have done something horribly, horribly wrong, or just suboptimal, we are soliciting feedback uh, at this um, <coughs> repository. Um, if you go there, you'll see there's a markdown. There's, there's, there's a markdown file where we are asking people to give us suggestions for ways we can tweak our ops and runs. I believe uh, during one of the, um, oh yeah, the, the LMC SNC talk on Tuesday, it was mentioned that uh, the, the LMC SNC community really wishes we were spending more time at the Southern Celestial Pole because that's where the LMC and SNC are. And Jelko responded with, "We have tools for that." That's what he was talking about. If you have a suggestion for how we could improve our cadence to observe your particular object, um, tell us here and we will consider whether or not we can actually incorporate that into a new offset run. And then we'll make that, if we can, we'll make that run, we'll release it, and you can tell us if it actually did improve upon your science, uh, uh, if it did, yeah, improve upon your science. Um, uh, another example, we did, uh, we did that, uh, we actually did that in the recent past, like in the last few months, some people had asked, asked for uh, what if you just observe the galactic plane at the same baseline cadence as the rest of the survey? I think people keep talking about the wide, fast, deep survey, which is the bulk of the sky else the sea will cover, which is being covered in a different cadence than the celestial pole, the galactic plane, or the ecliptic. And the galactic science community asked, well, why not just cover the galactic plane with the same cadence as wide, fast, deep? And so we actually ran that offset run and released it. Details are here. And the galactic community now has, galactic science community now has, now can evaluate that cadence and tell us whether or not using the white vesti actually does improve on our galactic science or not. Um, 
So we are definitely open to that kind of input. We would really <coughs> like that to receive it from you. Um, if you, if all of this sounds horribly tedious to you and you don't really feel like running your own metrics, we also have uh, servers that are, they, every time the benchmark cadences are released, there is, there's a host of, you know, probably on the order of 100 standard metrics that we do run on all of these benchmark cadences and serve up the results from these websites. Uh, if you go there, you'll look, you see, you'll, you'll have some kind of interface like this where you have the option to choose different ops and simulations, and then you can select what metric it is you want to see, so the co-added M5 depth in the U band, and then it'll show you, well, this is what that particular option simulation looked like in the U band. You can see the co-added M5 depth plot as an app in the sky here, and there's a histogram for the number of, um, what is it, yeah, the number of fields that had a particular value of, of M5, and so you can just browse through the existing offset runs if you want uh, from those websites. Um, and then finally, if you really do want to take the plunge and write your own metrics to evaluate the awesome runs for your own science, there's a GitHub repository uh, called Sims Map Contrib, which is designed explicitly for teaching people who are not us how to use math. Because the people who wrote math know how to use math really, really well, and they would like to, uh, but not everyone wrote math. And so I didn't write math. Uh, and so this, this GitHub repository contains a lot of really good, really helpful IPython notebooks that will just guide you step by step through how to write a metric, how to write it on an offset database, how to get uh, an evaluation of an LSSC simulated observation, uh, simulated cadence. So that's the how we schedule the LSSC part of the simulations tools. The other part we have is, okay, once we have an observing schedule, how are we going to analyze this data? How, how well are our analysis algorithms working? And as I said, that also exists in two parts. Uh, the cat sim tool, the catalog simulator, and the insim, the image simulator. The catalog simulator is really, I guess, a, a, maybe a somewhat more grandiose term for it is the LSST simulated universe. What it is, is it is a database that is hosted at the University of Washington and a bunch of code that the individual user system has that exists. Um, that are supposed to create a high fidelity simulation of the actual universe LSST will be observing. This database contains tables with all sorts of simulated celestial objects, galaxies, stars, uh, and galaxies and stars. Oh yeah, and asteroids and, and solar system and moving solar system objects. And then the software that the user actually downloads contains variability models, SEDs. Um, dust maps, and all the things necessary to turn a database of simulated objects into simulated LST observations. Um, so, the database. Uh, database contains uh, a distribution of Milky Way stars drawn from the Galfast simulations run by Mario. Um, it contains a distribution of galaxies painted onto the uh, Millennium Inbody simulation from De Lucia et al. And then it contains a distribution of solar system objects um, uh, from Rabbit All 2007. We are actually working to update this, uh, this particular simulation even as we speak, so that's not going to be Rabbit All for much longer. Um, the software that you download to run CatSim contains uh, Bruzewall and Charlotte Galaxy SEDs to associate with galaxies, uh, main sequence, dwarf star, white dwarf star SEDs from all of these sources to associate with stars, we even have SEDs for our solar system objects, uh, like SFD dust maps. And then, as I said at the beginning of the talk, we have the official LSSD bandcast throughputs, uh, code associating the contents of the database with all these data products, and then variability models for RL array, AGNs, Cepheids, M dwarf flares, type of supernovae, and solar system objects, which means that you can query, well, yeah, right, which means that you, which is what you need in conjunction with the database to generate actual simulated LSSD observations. And so the workflow for that is, um, on your on your system, so you download and install the LCC simulation stack, and then you, you specify the catalog parameters. So where am I pointing on the sky? How big is my catalog? What classes of objects do I want included in my catalog? The CatSim code translates that into a SQL query, which gets sent up to the University of Washington database, which the database you know queries the region of the sky that you told it to, returns a bunch of objects, and then your system then performs all of the necessary post processing. For example, associating objects with their SEDs, uh, interpolating the variability codes, correcting mean positions for proper motion, and uh, 
parallax and the motion of the Earth, um, and then integrating over the throughputs to get LC realistic LSST magnitudes and magnitude errors. And then voila, you have a simulated LSST catalog of, for example, photometric observations. Again, this is just meant to be uh, an illustration of how simple it is to use it. This is a catalog generating code that I again wrote up in about 10 minutes. Um, we, you know, we, we, we connect to the UW, UW database, we specify where the telescope is pointing, and then we just uh, run our catalog generating simulator software, and we end up with a bunch of, you know, a list of all, uh, mix, in this case I simulated a bunch of galaxies, and then their RA, their depths, uh, all of their magnitudes in this case, and their redshift printed into a text file. Um, this GitHub repository here contains, uh, and I'll, I'll, when I get to the actual demo part of this talk, I will go there and show it to you, but this contains, again, IPython notebooks that illustrate in detail how the system works, the velocity of this system, and hopefully will give you enough uh, intuitive understanding that you can generate your own simulated catalogs for your own, whatever objects you are interested in. Um, so I recommend going there. The image simulator, um, so, right, so CatSim exists to generate simulated catalogs, simulated objects, and, their, and the parameters to strike those objects. ImSim is a way to take those simulated catalogs and turn them into realistic LSD images. As I said, there are two software tools to do that right now. There is FoSim being generated by John Peterson and his group at Purdue, and GalSim, which as far as I can tell is being developed by everybody. It is a massive open source community uh, efforts, a lot of good work is going into it. It's sort of amazing. FOSIM, yeah, these two uh, products, while they both generate, uh, they both generate images, they do so in different ways that are useful for different things. FOSIM uh, <coughs> stands for the photon simulator, and that is mostly because the way FOSIM works is for any given object, it takes the SED, treats that SED as a distribution of photons, and then draws photons from that distribution and propagates them through the telescope. Well, no, propagates them through the atmosphere of the telescope. It has detailed models of the, the lenses and the mirrors and the refraction and the, ref the, the refraction coefficients and the reflectivity of every component of LSST, and it builds the image up photon by photon. What this means is that it is slow, however, it is also very detailed. FOSIM does not assume a PSF. FOS FOSIM simulates a PSF. And so um, you can use, if you don't, if you want a high fidelity simulation of the LSST's PSF, you probably want to use FOSIM uh, because it's, it will build it up photon by photon based on the refraction, the refractive properties of the actual LSST telescope, as we understand it at this point. Gaussian is a much faster tool. It, um, it basically it, it, it assumes every, it, it, it takes all of its noise in PSF. Um, it takes all of its noise and, and uh, PSF inputs as models. So you tell it, okay, I want to double Gaussian PSF with you know, these widths, or you know, my noise is I expect this many counts per pixel from the sky, and it just plops that down onto the image. And so it, you, know, you get in what you get out. You don't discover anything new about the PSF from Gaussian. So if you're just interested in, if you, you know, interested in your analysis tool can deal with a specific PSF that you can parameterize easily, Gaussian is the way to go. Um, there is, you know, the advantage of that is it's fast. Um, I'm about to show you simulated images, like one single chip simulated images from both. Photosim took about six hours to simulate one chip. Uh, Galson took about 20 minutes. So there's a significant uh, speed up involved in using Galson. Uh, so just be aware of what you're trying to achieve before you pick one of these tools to use. Uh, also, I should say, as I said, Galson is a massive community effort. There's a lot of development going in. At the point where I wrote this slide, the, uh, the PSF and noise models were kind of ad hoc. That has changed. Uh, there are people, uh, Josh Myers at Stanford is putting in a lot of work, actually putting in atmospheric screen simulation into Galson to simulate the, the PSF due to the atmosphere. And then, as uh, Andy mentioned in the last session, uh, Craig Lage, I think he's also at Stanford, is putting in a uh, Davis, sorry, uh, is putting in a lot of effort to model sensor effects in Gaussian. So you hear people talking about brighter, fatter. Um, that's going to be incorporated in Gaussian, if not in the next release, in the one after that. Uh, so there's a lot of active, rapid development going on in Gaussian, and so um, it's definitely good to keep your eye on. Um, the way that these tools generally work is also slightly different. Uh, so the way 
most of works is you use Taxon to generate an instance catalog, which is a fancy name for a text file with all the objects that you want to simulate. And then you feed those into Fosin, and Fosin produces a fixed image output. Gaussian has actually a seamless integration. One of the LSST simulations uh, software tools uh, called Sims underscore Gaussian interface is a tool that takes the CATSIM framework and directly melts it to Gaussian so you can just, in one call, tell, Gal tell the LSST software stack that you want to generate a bunch of Gaussian images on uh, this patch of the sky using these objects, and it will just automatically write out um, your images to disk. Uh, and that is all documented in the CATSIM uh, demos that I mentioned on the last slide or two slides ago. This is a simulated FOSIN image, which obviously looks a lot better on my screen. Uh, the things I want to draw your attention to is, as I said, FOSIN has a very high fidelity uh, model of the telescope and, and its detector. So you can see here you have some bleeding here from this high, very bright star uh, also there. Um, and so you have actual realistic physical effects in your detector. Uh, compare that to this Gaussian image uh, where you don't get that. That hasn't been implemented in Gaussian yet, but as I said, it's coming. Um, yeah, it's horribly washed out. You should probably just look at my screen capture later on. But I mean, both of, well, both of these things have going for them. You know, they both have you know, stars and galaxies everywhere. They're both drawn from the same Gaussian simulation. Um, yeah, and as I said, this took, uh, this took six hours to generate, this took 20 minutes. Okay, so that concludes the 30,000 uh, foot view part of the talk. I just want to, again, remind you that all of this stuff has been documented here at the official LSC simulations webpage. Community.lsc.org. Take your questions there, they will be answered, I promise. Um, yeah, and so. Any questions before I get into the interactive, or not interactive, but the actual software part of this? Uh, the actual implementation part of this talk. Somebody? Okay. Uh, yeah, and I'll make sure these slides are wherever it is the dark place putting the slides. Okay. Okay, so let's run some LSST simulation. So the, the, the easiest way to get the LSST stack is probably through Conda. Conda is uh, a Python-based tool for distributing binary software. Uh, and LSST in the last six or so months, thanks to a Herculean effort by Mario, has begun distributing binary, has begun distributing its software in binary form through Conda, which means that once you have Conda installed, uh, you can just literally type conda install lsst apps or lsst distrib or lsst sims and get the appropriate lsst software tool. Um, I'm not going to go through installing conda because that takes more time than I want to spend, but the, uh, to get conda, if you don't know what, what that is, you just go to go to this web page and download the appropriate install script. Uh, right now, lsst is only in, um, is only, uh, only runs with Python 2.7. Hopefully by the end of, we're fixing that. But right now, make sure you download the Python 2.7 version of Conda. You download that script into a folder somewhere, just run it, and it will set up a self-contained uh, Python environment that will allow you to get the, you know, all the necessary prerequisites, NumPy, SciPy, MacPuffin, all of that. I have, as I said, I have already done that, so we're going to just use my existing Conda installation. So. Uh, let's see if I can get there. <coughs> no. There we go. That's what I get. Okay. Okay. So I created on my machine this directory, Conda for install. It's where I use my, uh, put my Conda when I want to test the Conda installation the stack. And you can see that the mini Conda installation script this in this directory. I, I just ran that with bash <laughs> miniconda install and it, it asked me a lot of questions and I answered them appropriately and it resulted in there being a directory in here uh, called miniconda2. And in miniconda2, that is where all of the conda software that I downloaded and installed exists. And so if I want to use, and so that conda installation comes with its own version of Python and its own Python packages that only that Python knows about. And so if I want to use it, I have to 
make sure that that Python occurs on my path. And that Python execute will exist in the mini conda2 slash bin directory. So if I want to go ahead and use this conda. So uh, for example, if I, I ask what Python I'm using now, I'm just using the Python that came with my, with my system. But if I <coughs> append, or prepend, excuse me, mini conda bin to my path, Using the Python that comes with this installation of mini Conda. And that also gives me access to the tool Conda. Conda is a tool that is used to add and update packages to your Conda environment. So once we've gone through this step, once, once you are in your environment and using the Conda installation, you can get the LSST simulation software, for example, by just typing, uh, by, uh, by typing Conda install LSST sims. There's one step you have to do before. Conda, as a command, there are a series of channels in your Conda configuration that represent URLs that Conda looks for, looks at when you tell it to install a package. So if I type Conda info, I have, you see these channel URLs. Uh, these are places when I tell Conda to install something, this is where it goes to look. And this, this channel here, conda.lsst.code slash sims, is where the LSST simulation software uh, I believe conda.lst.codes.stack is where the DM software lives. And so if I didn't have those, well, here, just a second, let me uh, remove them and put it, put, remove it and put it back. So I do conda config remove channels conda.http uh, conda.lst.codes sims. And now conda info, it no longer knows about conda codes. Sims. And so if I were coming at this fresh, I would want to add that channel to my conda distribution. And conda config add channels HTTP uh, conda.lsst.codes slash sims. Conda config, excuse me, conda info. And there we are, the, the simulations channel is back. And so at this point, to install the LSST simulation software, I would just type conda install lsst-sims. I'm not going to do that because it's going to take about 20 minutes. Uh, there are a bunch of data libraries in the simulation software, libraries and SEDs, variable variability like curves, sky darkness maps, that take a long time to download. But this is, you would enter this command and then you would wait for 20 minutes and you would have the lsst sims stack installed. So let's pretend I did that. Now, what I want to do is I want to, so I have the LSST simulations code installed, but it's not set up. And so the first step, once you're in your Conda environment, for setting up the LSST simulation software is to set up EUBS. Uh, EUBS is the package managing system that LSST uses to um, manage which version of the stack you're, you're using at any given time. Uh, the LSST stack is designed, designed to be very modular and very clever in its modularity so that you can have multiple versions of the stack on your system at the same time and you use EUPS to tell your system which version you want to be, you want to have set up and actually running at, a at any given time. So the first thing I have to do, I mean, so tell, the first thing to notice is, you know, right now if I ask where the command EFS is, oh, there's an EFS here already. Okay. Uh, Let's see if that works. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I already had EUPS installed that comes with the LSST simulation software. Uh, and so I tried to tell it to set up LSST SIGs, but it didn't want to do that. So what I have to do first is set up EUPS, and I do that with the command source EUPS setups.sh. And Conda will know where, the, where that is if you install the stack. And so now I can, so now uh, I have set up my version of the apps, which knows about all of the stack install, but it can install versions of the stack. And I can do uh, set up lsst underscore sims, and yeah, that should just set up my stack. As I said, EOPS allows you to have <coughs> many different versions of the stack on your system at once. If you ever want to know what versions of the stack are on your system, there's a command EOPS list and then package name. So there's a package, for example, sims cat utils. And if I type that command, it will tell me 
what versions of sins cat utils I have in my system. And apparently I have version sin, you know, version 2.2.6b, uh, and that version is now currently set up, which means I can use it. Um, if I did unset up sins cat utils, and then I did EFS list, it's not locked to set up, which means that if I try to do it, try to use it uh, from LSST sins cat utils, I would get a complaint that I don't have. Like, Python's telling me, I don't know where since cat utils is, what are you talking about? And that's what that EF setup command does. By doing setup lsst sims, I have now set up all the sims packages and I can import them. So if I'm from lsst sims cat utils in import base models, and it thinks and it thinks and it thinks. But it, it always gets that warning. It's innocuous as far as I can tell. Um, but there, uh, so, so we have now set up the LSC simulation stack and we can use it. So that's great. Let's, uh, okay. So now what I'm going to do is, uh, as I said, I've drawn up a demo for you. Uh, and let's, let's run through it. So uh, the demo I have drawn up exists on GitHub. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just clone it directly so you know where to find it. So I'm gonna just make a directory uh, demo LSST Europe. I'll go in there. And now the the demo that I am uh, I'm gonna be running exists in the GitHub repository UW SSG University of Washington Survey Science Group LSST tutorials. This is a GitHub repository that the University of Washington LSST group uses whenever we do a tutorial demonstration for ourselves. Um, it's in varying degrees of maintenance, but some of the, some of the at least uh, the part that I'm going to show you, I'm going to, it, 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 I try to keep it as up to date as possible because that is it's the best documentation of how to use the CatSim software, which is what I am uh, going to show you. So I can I call that repository.
access to, through which you tunnel to get to um, to get to this database. So in order to actually use this notebook and actually query the database, I need to open a separate terminal and open a tunnel <coughs> to fatboyfizzwashington.eu directed to my port 1433, and then I'm logging in as sims user at gateway.astro.washington.edu. In order for you to be able to do this, we're going to have to give you permissions to log on as sims user. That's very easy. Just email me your um, SSH public key, and I will add it to the list of authorized keys that are allowed to log on as sims user. Um, my email address was on the first, uh, first slide of my talk. Scott.gmail.com, which you might guess is a little obsessed with what it is in my teenage, in my teenage years. Um, and so just send me your public key. I'll add it to the list of authorized public keys, and you'll be able to set up this as an SSH tunnel. Um, but right now, there. I'm logged on to Sims user. I'm tunneling through to Fatboy, which means I can now run the example notebook. So just quick import statements. So what we're going to demo here is a tool we have developed. As, as I said, the LSST CatSim software contains variability models for all sorts of stars. I'm going to demo some tools that we just wrote to take those variability models, combine them with an OpSim database run, and create realistic LSST light curves. So it will, it, what it will do is it will take the OpSim database, the OpSim simulated observing cadence, it will query the database of the UW to figure out which, in this case, are our library stars it were observed by that chance, and then and at what times they were observed, and then it will calculate the magnitudes and the magnitude errors of those sources at those times and output that as a light curve. So, yeah, that's what we're doing here. So the first thing I need to do is, uh, or you would need to do, is download an OpSim database, one of those databases of simulated uh, observations. You can do that from this website. I already did that. Um, mine is living in this convoluted path on my machine, so I'm just going to tell the iPython notebook where the OpSim database is living. Uh, the next thing I need to do is connect to the UW database so I can get at our table full of our, our library stars. The way we handle connections to the UW database is through a class of Python objects that exists in uh, this module, the lsst.sims.catutils.base catalog models. Uh, if I were to just import base catalog models and do a and do a dir on it, uh, I would get a list of all the available models that are there. There are there are objects, there are catalog objects to connect to our database of uh, blue horizontal branch stars, of cepheids, of comets, dwarf galaxies. Uh, Easter eggs is something for validation. Uh, Eclipse and binaries, AGNs, galaxy, uh, uh, galaxies, you know, uh, main belt asteroids, etc., etc., etc. There's also a confluence page explaining what each of these objects does and which of the which which class of objects it exists on. Uh, it's just important to keep in mind the objects that exist on the UW database. They're segregated by table. There's a table for main main sequence stars. There's a table for, there's a table for main sequence and NLT dwarf stars. There's a table for R library, there's a table for Sepians, there's a table for white dwarfs, there's a table for galaxies. And so depending on what class of objects you want you're worrying about at any given time, uh, you'll connect to a different table. If you want all of the objects, you'll just have to connect to the tables in series and output them to your catalog in series, but that is something that can be done. I want R library, so I'm going to import the R library star object, which connects to the R to the database table of R library, and I will instantiate that as star D. I pass it my database of stars and my database of OpSim simulated 
observations. Now what I want to do is I want to get a set of pointings from my OpSim database. And the way that that works is you specify uh, a range in RA and a deck, basically a rough triangle on the sky, and a set of band passes you care about. And what the light curve generator does is it queries the OpSim database for all of the pointings in that rectangle, in that region on the sky, and using the filters you specify. A quick note about this. This work, right now this works because of the way OpSim works. Uh, OpSim schedules its pointings by taking the sky and dividing it into hexes and a few pentagons. And at any given point, OpSim says, I am pointing at this particular hex. It's an OpSim, I'm drawing at this particular OpSim field. And so with this get pointings method does is it queries for all of those hexes whose centers are within this rectangle. As you might guess, there are some weird edge cases where if there, you know, if my if my rectangle, if there's a hex that leads over, you know, the boundary of my rectangle, I'm not going to get this hex because its center is not actually in the rectangle of sky that I've specified. <coughs> we are working to input, we're working our way around that. We'll figure out a better implementation. This is kind of just a first draft implementation of light curve generator. Um, as kind of a proof of principle. But so I run this, and I'm going to, what I'm going to get out, just wait for a second, mm -hmm. um, it's querying the Austin database, it's getting all the pointings. Okay, and so now pointings is two-dimensional list uh, of what we call observation metadata. Observation metadata is a Python class that we have implemented to describe telescope pointings. It contains information <coughs> about where on the sky you're pointing, what filter you're using, how the camera has been rotated relative to the sky, what the, M, the five sigma limiting magnitude was in the sky at that point in time, and what the seeing is. Uh, all of that information is contained in the Austin database and has been written to these observation metadata objects. The pointings object here is, like I said, a two-dimensional list, each row of, of, of which is a set of observation metadata that are all pointing at the same point in the sky. So for example, if I just, I'll, I'll print now the, the first, the length of, oh, it's called pointing, okay. Um, first row. So pointings has three rows. The first row has 492 observations in it. Um, and then I can also let me just insert so below. You know, I can say, so if I go uh, pointing, uh, I pointings zero, zero. It's an observation metadata. And so I can ask for point So LCDict is a dict that 
is keyed off of first some integer uniquely identifying each RR library in our set. And then for each of those, it's keyed off of filter name. And then within the filter name, there's a key for MJD, which is an array of the MJDs in which observations were taken. And then, so, uh, MJD, and then mag, which is to the magnitudes in the filter at which the, uh, at the MJDs where the observations were taken. And then there's going to be a key error that is a list of the errors. And so, Based on the file name from the truth dict. 
So the, all the, this is just a loop that is going to go through the first 10 R Larry like curves and compute the long scar of the diagram, get the best fit period, and then compare it to what, what I think the truth, what the truth value should be in our simulations. So it's looping through. I have to uh, suppress this output from Gatsby yet. And so I go through, and I'll have a list of true periods and found periods, and I'll just print them out, and you see, again, they're all pretty close. So we have successfully extracted the light curves, extracted the period from the light curves. It's almost like science. Um, and so that is the kind of thing that you can do with this light curve extraction period. And this is the simplest possible, uh, this is the simplest example for me to implement, but there are many more examples. As I said, there's a light curve extractor for super, type 1A supernovae. So the people who worry about photometric classic, classification of supernovae can generate light curves from there and see how well they how well those light curves would identify the supernovae as type 1 A's. Uh, we have an AGN variable, a variability model, so we can, we can analyze that as well. Yes? Is this kind of analysis of the light curves performed only on a single band, or you can extend it to more bands? Um, there, is, there is no reason you could not extend it to more bands. I am. But my, my, my expertise is in the simulations, the LST simulations, and so we are trying. You have all of the, the light curves and all the bands. If you have a tool that will do a multi-band light curve analysis, you can feed this into that. There is, you, it's just a bunch of Python. It's a bunch of Python lists, so it's lists of dates and lists of magnitudes. Uh, so yeah, you could you could analyze multi-band information. Yes, the Gatsby has a multi-band Okay, Gatsby has that. So. Because yeah. this is very important, because the cadence of the different bands is going to be different. And yes. This means that you are taking advantage of the information here. Yes, yes, that is, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Yeah, no, that will be in the light curve information you get from this. Each, because remember, it's a multi-level dict, uh, each band will have its own MJD array representing whenever it was observed in that band. And so you're right, the cadences in each of the bands will be different. Um, any other questions? Okay, so now let's say let's say you have decided that we don't know what we're doing and you want to experiment with your own offset cadence uh, and basically generate your own series of observations and see how well they do. Uh, the next part of the snowboard is going to show you how to do that. Uh, as I said, right now offset is in a state where it's really just being run by loop in Tucson. But, if, but for the purposes of this tool, for the purposes of the light curve analysis, all, light curve generator, all you have to do is generate a SQL light database that looks like the Opsin database and has the information containing the Opsin database, and you can get out a simulated light curve. And specifically, you just need to create a SQL light database that contains this summary table, which is a table of uh, uh, a table in the in the Opsin database that summarizes the observations. This link here will take you to schema for the offset summary table. Scroll on down, scroll on down, and you see it has things like offset ID, that's an integer, you know, like offset ID of three means it was the third observation. Um, field RA, field depth, which is where you were pointed. Filter, filter you're using. Uh, X MJD, the MJD of the exposure, um, and then a bunch of other information. In order, for the purposes of the light curve extractor, you really only need to simulate Field RA, field deck, where you're pointed, uh, filt, uh, filter, X MJD, when you're pointed, five sigma limiting magnitude, and filter sky lights. With that data in, in, a, in any SQL light database, you can trick the light curve generator into thinking you've given it a proper offset, uh, offset, uh, offset database. So I'm going to generate a SQL light database with that, all of that information. So this, so first we're going to start out uh, this cell. I'm just going to, I'm going to do it randomly. I'm not doing anything intelligent. Uh, I'm going to generate a bunch of random MJDs. I'm going to say that I only want to observe at RA of 112 and deck of negative 31. And then for all those random MJDs, I am going to calculate the solar RA and deck, convert that into an altitude and azimuth, and then I will select only the observations for which the sun was 10 degrees below the horizon. 
and then I will further only select those observations that were where the altitude of my field RA and deck was, <coughs> above, was 45 degrees above the horizon. And that will be my list of simulated, observed, and JGs. And you'll get a Tanache's warning. It happens. Still running. Okay, so now I have a list of MJDs for my simulated observations. Great. Now, um, I, this is just some bookkeeping. So the, the next step is we need to calculate, as I said, the five sigma limiting magnitude and the sky brightness. And that is going to involve, uh, here, let me just randomly generate some seeing first. That is going to involve having throughput information on the bandpass. Uh, the bandpass of the LSST, both the hardware and the total bandpass dict at different air masses. Uh, or the, 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 total, the total throughput information of filter, lens, mirror, plus atmosphere at different air masses. And so what, uh, in, the, in the simulations, again, in this scale, no, uh, in the simulations, in this throughput package, we have a subdirectory, Atmos, that contains atmospheric throughput files at a bunch of um, uh, air mass, air mass values. Uh, it goes from one up to two point five in increments of point one. And so what I'm doing here is I'm looping through those values of air mass, and I'm loading up all of the LSST band passes, both the uh, the total hardware plus atmosphere and the hardware only throughputs at all of those air mass values. Uh, and that's going to do that. And it's just loading it into this, we have this class bandpass dict, which is a um, an extension of Python's dict class, specifically for LSST bandpasses. It just has some extra features where it makes sure that all the bandpasses are sampled on the same wavelength grid so that magnitude calculations are faster <coughs> um, or more standardized. And so it's running, there we go. We now have a dict of total atmosphere plus hardware bandpasses, uh, throughputs, and hardware only. Another useful tool that was recently added to the LSST simulation software is a is the Sky model, uh, the Sky Brightness model. Uh, something that Peter Yoko has been working on for another part of a year. We've been taking data actually from the site. I believe it was supplied by Gemini and ESO. We've been taking data from the ESO, like where ESO measured the sky brightness at the actual or near the actual LSST site, and Peter's been breaking it down into. Uh, scattered starlight, zodiacal light, scattered twilight, scattered moonlight, and creating a model where you can specify an MJD, specify where, and it'll figure out where the sun is, where the moon is, and it will give you a, an actual emission SED, as, as near as we can tell, for the sky at the LSST site on that day, ignoring weather, which you, know, you can't predict. Um, Well, you 
just do return wave spec, and it will return a wavelength grid and uh, flux. Uh, this is in nanometers, and this is in you know, er ergs per second per centimeter squared per nanometer. Um, um, an SCD representing the sky emission at that position at that time at the LSST site. Uh, and then I will ingest that into the LSST SED model, it's just a class we for SEDs. And then I will use another simulations method, the calc M5 method, to calculate the bi sigma limiting magnitude, which requires a sky SED, uh, total bandpass throughputs, hardware bandpass throughputs, a list of photometric parameters, which I just uh, uploaded a standard F SED value, and then also the seeding value, uh, which I generated randomly earlier. Uh, this photometric parameters is just a class here that contains things like the gain, the dark noise, um, the thing, the parameters of the LS of the LSST detectors that are not observed, observing condition dependent, presumably. So now I'll just run that and get out a bunch of sky brightnesses and M5s. Should it still be running? Oh, there we go. And so now I have um, all of my data. I have my pointing, I have my M5, I have sky brightness, I have NJDs, and I have a C value full with that max. That's the other thing you need. And I can create a mock ops and database. And so I'll just use SQLite 3 to do that. And I'll just ingest all of that into a database. Um, this is all just kind of boilerplate code that you would use. Note that you have to name the fields the same thing that Opsin names them so that the light curve generator can, knows what to expect. And that should be done. And so now I will re-instantiate, I'll instantiate a new light curve generator using, uh, again, the RLI ready database table. And this so DB file name is the name of the dummy let Opsin database that I generated here. And so I'll just create generator. I'll get my pointings. There's only one pointing this time because I only simulated one, uh, one patch of the sky. And now I will generate some light curves. And again, it's querying the database for our library that are in my patch of sky and it generated a bunch of light curves. And so I had 82 objects and so I can just uh, print LC First one, let's just see what that looks like. The first object we have again is really ugly. We have okay, just, um, uh, uh, is, yeah, so I have IRNG light curves for objects in this patch of sky using this mock cadence that I pulled out of the ether. Um, and you can, you can run the same analysis that we did on the, on the other on the other light curves that came from the actual loss of database. And so the hope is, so so yeah so the hope our hope is that you'll use these tools to you know analyze different observing strategies for different variability for different different sort forms of variables uh, variable objects and you know tell us what is the best observing strategy for photometrically identifying or what is the minimal best observing strategy for photometrically identifying a type one supernovae or you know what is the what is the safest observing cadence that you want to get um, you know to be able to extract the period of an arbitrary variable source uh, that sort of thing uh, that we need help with because we're going to have to schedule a telescope sometime in the next you know five years uh, or less so so yeah um, I just also want to make a quick plug so a lot of this. Um, I talked about things like the observation metadata or the database object to connect to the UW database. This is all part of the CATSIM framework. Uh, in this same uh, GitHub repository, there's also an IPython notebook, CATSIM tutorials, simulations, AHM, all hands meeting, 1503. This is an IPython notebook that walks through the entire CATSIM framework as it existed uh, in March 2015, which is still kind of the basis of everything. Uh, and it's a very good tutorial for how CATSIM works and the philosophy behind CATSIM. Uh, I would recommend, like, in the same way that since Math Contrib is the place you go to learn about math, this is the place you go to learn about cats and how to generate your own catalogs of objects from the UW database. Any questions? Okay, I have a question. Um, 
So we have all of these tools. We have offset for generating simulated observing cadences. We have me the metrics analysis framework for analyzing those cadences. We have CatSim to generate catalogs of objects, Instant for images. What sorts of things would you like to see? What simulation tools can we provide you with to help you best analyze the usefulness of LSST for the science that you care about? Does anyone have a, have a shot at this? Um, a way to generate uh, different cases ourselves that are relying on your meaning and maker addresses would be useful. Once, I mean, uh, moving objects will have to be done there, but uh, um, those don't allow the flexibility to test things like multiple exposures on the same spot. And so it's Right, right, okay. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, I mean, honestly, I mean, at the end of the day, no, that is possible. Like I said, uh, the, uh, the Offset database is, at the end of the day, just a SQLite database. So, it would, no, we could totally write a Python tool that you give it some sorts of, you give it parameters, and it generates a database that is consistent with the Offset schema so that the rest of the simulations tools thinks it's just an Offset database. So, so, that, so that, is, that is something that probably has to be implemented at the Austin level, and that is, that is a great candidate for um, that repository Give us feedback. 